Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Antibios webinar. My name is Chris Maitis. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Antibios. I hope you've all found a, a nice, quiet place in your home. Those of you that are working from home these days, um, you're really going to enjoy this presentation. Um, this is the first in a series of pain webinars that we have uh, this month and next month. Um, so be sure to uh, register for the next two webinars. Also, we have Dr. Cheryl Stuckey on June 18th, and then Dr. Laura Stone on June 23rd. Uh, this day and age without conferences, we found that it's important to uh, be able to keep up to speed on what's going on in the pain research field. And so uh, we are delighted to uh, present these webinars in collaboration with these great scientists. So before I introduce Dr. Price, we'd just like to tell you all a little bit about Antibios. I know many of you know Antibios and we uh, collaborate with you. But uh, to those of you that uh, have not heard about Antibios, we are a unique contract research organization and biotech company based in San Diego, California. We procure human tissue samples for, from ethically consented donors and use the tissue or cells to perform physiological assays in which uh, we can test preclinical compounds for drug discovery projects. We have essentially redefined first in human. So for more information about Antibios, feel free to reach out to me directly or um, check out our website at antibios.com. So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Dr. Ted Price and um, be sure to stay tuned at the end. We will do uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, Dr. Price is one of the foremost researchers in understanding how neuronal plasticity alters the way the brain receives no susceptive information from the sensory system and how this relates to chronic pain in human patients. Ted has discovered several novel targets, Ted and his team, that regulate the excitability of sensory neurons after injury and that mediate plasticity in the central nervous system that cause pain to become chronic. Dr. Price's work has been published in numerous scientific journals and his research program has been supported by the National Institutes of Health and the Migraine Research Foundation. He serves as an editor uh, for several leading industry journals and received the Patrick D. Wall Young Investigator Award from the International Association for the Study of Pain. Dr. Price also received the John C. Liebeskind Early Career Scholar Award from the American Pain Society, the Burmester Rising Star Award from UT Dallas, and has been named a permanent member of the NIH Somatosensory and Pain Study Section. Dr. Price earned his bachelor's degree from UT Dallas and a doctoral degree in pharmacology from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And he did a postdoc at McGill University. So uh, Antibios has had the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Price and his team over the years. In fact, his uh, 2018 paper uh, published in Pain with his colleagues is something that I refer to quite often with partners looking for particular targets at human DRGs. Uh, for that project, he acquired some lumbar samples from normal and pain donors, and um, people looking for different expression of uh, different targets can refer to that paper. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Price, and his presentation today is Human Dorsal Ganglion Transcriptomics for Pain Mechanism Discovery and Therapeutic Development. Ted, take it away. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Is that true, Chris? Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks, Dan. Oh, We're all set. Okay, good. So uh, th thanks very much for that uh, very nice intro. Thanks to Antibios for uh, inviting me to do this. And as, as Chris mentioned, we've, we've worked uh, pretty closely with Antibios over the years, and I'm going to be showing uh, quite a bit of data uh, from our uh, ongoing collaboration, which has mostly been around uh, working with uh, human dorsal ganglion tissue uh, that Antibios has uh, obtained and that we, we've done molecular studies on. So uh, I do have some disclosures. Let's see. So I, uh, uh, in addition to, to being an academic scientist, I, I'm very interested in uh, taking what we discover and uh, turning it into therapeutics. And uh, to that end, um, we started a couple different companies today. I will talk a little bit about our work on uh, 4E therapeutics because it's uh, directly related to some of the topics I'll 
talk about in my uh, talk today. This is our, our, our big group at, at UT Dallas. Uh, we recently started the Center for Advanced uh, Pain Studies, which is supported by uh, UTD. Uh, the center is uh, co-led by uh, myself and by my colleague, Greg Dussor, who I've, I've worked with uh, for uh, several decades now. G Greg and I were both PhD students at the same time in Ken Hargreaves and Chris Flores' lab at, the, at UT Health Science Center, uh, San Antonio, and we've run our group jointly now for uh, quite some time. Uh, we, we've recently been joined by Michael Burton, who's here, who's uh, doing some really terrific work on uh, neuroimmune interactions as well as uh, aging and pain. So uh, I think you'll be seeing some really uh, wonderful stuff coming from his lab uh, uh, very soon. And I'll, I'll talk today about the work of a, a couple of uh, postdoctoral fellows and uh, graduate students in my lab. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sequencing work that Pradip Ray, who's right here, uh, has been doing on human DRG. I'll talk quite a bit about the uh, RNA scope in situ hybridization work that Stephanie Shires has done. Stephanie just uh, completed her uh, PhD with me and is now uh, doing uh, postdoctoral work with me. And then I'll, uh, towards the end of the talk, talk about some interesting computational neuroscience work that Candler Page and Andy Wang Zhu uh, have, have uh, been doing in our lab. So pain is a huge uh, clinical problem, as I think everybody uh, who's uh, tuning in here knows. And uh, we don't have very good options to treat chronic pain. This is one of my favorite uh, paintings from uh, one of the world's uh, greatest artists um, of all time, uh, Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo, uh, in addition to being a uh, exceptional uh, artist, uh, also had a, a pretty severe pain problem uh, that she had for most of her life. When, when she was a, a late teenager, uh, she was in an accident in, in Mexico City and had a, had a spine injury. And she had many surgeries uh, over the course of her lifetime to try, to try to fix the pain that she had from this uh, spine injury. And un unfortunately, I don't, I don't think that she ever really uh, got any kind of medical relief for her pain. I think uh, her art was a major outlet for that. And this particular uh, painting called uh, Without Hope really shows the kind of anguish that she was in trying to recover uh, from one of these surgeries. Unfortunately, uh, e even though we've had a, a, a huge amount of basic science work that's been done in, in the field, um, the situation in terms of therapeutics hasn't changed very much from the time of Frida Kahlo. I think there's a lot of hope uh, on the horizon. We, we've had a lot of um, uh, new therapies get approved recently, in particular CGRP therapies for uh, uh, migraine. And th I think there's some exciting stuff on the horizon for neuropathic pain. But uh, as a whole, I think we, we can all agree that we can do better. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we're trying to think within, within our group at uh, UT Dallas and our collaborators on uh, advancing new therapeutics, uh, in particular for neuropathic pain. So we've spent a, a, a good amount of uh, our time working on how uh, inflammatory mediators and other signals from immune cells can act uh, on nociceptors to change their excitability. And we know that changes in gene expression are really important for this. And we, we've spent a lot of our time focusing on translation regulation uh, in particular. And uh, to this end, in the last couple of years, we've published quite a few papers uh, demonstrating that downstream of uh, many cytokine receptors, G protein coupled receptors, and tyrosine receptor kinases, you get activation of the MAP kinase pathway. And this leads to activation of a kinase that's downstream of ERK that doesn't get a lot of attention actually in the neuroscience field. This uh, kinase is called MINK. And this kinase is actually very specific for phosphorylating a particular protein called EIF4E that binds to the five prime end, uh, the five prime cap of uh, mRNAs and regulates the translation of a very specific subset um, of mRNAs that in nociceptors at least seem to play a really important role in excitability. So we're, we're trying to tease apart exactly what those uh, 
uh, mRNAs are and, and, and how they work. And I, we've got a couple papers on the horizon uh, related to that, but we're, we're pretty convinced that mink is a, a potential uh, really good target for the treatment of neuropathic pain. So why, why do we think that? Well, we, we've done many, many experiments in, in animals uh, using uh, behavioral approaches, behavioral genetics, and also pharmacology. We also have done uh, lots and lots of electrophysiology. And I, I like this experiment because I think it kind of wraps up the whole picture very nicely. So this is a, a set of mouse dorsal ganglion neurons that are put onto a micro uh, electrode array. So there's a bunch of electrodes here that can record the activity of these neurons. And what we do is uh, we record the baseline activity and in wild type mice, and also in mice that lack this phosphorylation site for mink on EIF4E, at baseline, there really is no activity uh, in the dish. But if we add IL-6, you see in this raster plot, so each line here is an action potential, you see that the activity of the neurons fundamentally changes. They, they become very excitable. They start firing lots of action potentials. And the key, I think, really, is when you take the IL-6 away, these neurons have a changed phenotype. So now they continue to fire action potentials even though you've taken the stimulus away. So this suggests to me that this relatively brief exposure to IL-6 can cause these uh, neurons to transition from being inactive to being spontaneously active. And uh, I think that uh, many of us in the pain field think that spontaneous activity in nociceptors is a key driver of neuropathic pain. So what happens in neurons taken from mice that lack this eif 4 e phosphorylation site for me? Well, they show an initial response to IL-6, but it, it, it pretty rapidly tails off and it never gets reaches the magnitude of what you see in the wild type. But the really important thing, I think, is that when you look at later time points, these neurons don't ever really transition to having spontaneous activity. So, uh, taking out mink signaling seems to block the development of spontaneous activity in uh, sensory neurons. So those experiments were done in mice, and that's that's actually the only uh, experiment, except uh, two experiments at the end uh, that I'll show you. That's mouse data. The entire rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about our, our work in human uh, dorsal ganglion. So as I mentioned at the start, we, we've had a really great collaboration with Anabios, but we, we also have another source for uh, dorsal root ganglion tissue, and that's through our collaboration with Pat Doherty and his colleagues um, at MD Anderson. So at MD Anderson, uh, they have uh, patients that have uh, cancer, and some of them uh, have cancer that's infiltrated their uh, vertebrae. So you can see here, uh, there's a, a large tumor. Uh, this uh, patient, is at risk for uh, major uh, spine injury because of this tumor. And the patient is going to have a surgery called a vertebrectomy where they go in and they, they take out the tumor and the surrounding uh, vertebrae and basically rebuild the spine around the uh, spinal cord. As part of the process of doing this uh, surgery, the dorsal root ganglia are often in the way and are actually removed. So, this creates a really great opportunity for us because we can phenotype these patients beforehand. So for instance, in this particular patient, we know that they have pain in, in certain uh, dermatomes. Uh, this particular one has pain on one side of their body and not the other one. So when we take out these dorsal root ganglia, we can then do electrophysiology and RNA sequencing, which is what we have, have been doing over the last couple of years uh, through this collaboration and get an idea of what is uh, changing in DRGs that innervate painful areas versus DRGs uh, that are potentially normal and are not causing neuropathic pains, neuropathic pain in these patients. So one of the first things I mentioned was that the spontaneous activity seems to be a key driver of neuropathic pain, but we, we don't really know if uh, spontaneous activity is present uh, coming from the DRG cell bodies um, in patients with uh, neuropathic pain versus patients without neuropathic pain. So this is one of the first experiments that we did along these lines, and all this electrophysiology was done in uh, Pat's lab uh, by Rob North and uh, Yan Li. And essentially what they found is that it was extremely rare to see spontaneous activity in DRG neurons taken from patients that did not have pain. But if we looked at the DRG neurons that came from the dermatomes where they did have pain, uh, about 
of those neurons showed spontaneous activity uh, in the dish. So this is, I think, good evidence that uh, uh, neuropathic pain is accompanied by spontaneous activity uh, emanating from the, the uh, soma of DRG neurons. So this provides an opportunity then to test hypotheses that we uh, have that previously we could only really look at in animal models. So we, uh, as I mentioned before, are very interested in mink and EIF phosphorylation as a driver of spontaneous activity in uh, neuropathic pain. We have lots of animal model evidence for this, but we can use a, a mink inhibitor. In this case, we use an inhibitor called EFT508, which was developed by a, a company called Effector Therapeutics. And if we put this inhibitor on a DRG neuron that shows spontaneous activity, you see that uh, this is uh, reversed, suggesting that blocking mink activity can eliminate spontaneous um, activity in human nociceptors. So we, we think this is a really good uh, kind of clinical uh, bridge to take this uh, idea forward and, and try to develop a therapeutic. So we've done exactly that. We uh, started a, a company about a year ago called 4E uh, Therapeutics. Uh, we uh, have re recruited a, a CEO, Craig Benson, who's at, at the head of this company. And then uh, Jim Son um, is our uh, head of drug discovery. He's a medicinal chemist. He's also in Austin. So our, our, our company is, is based in Austin. And uh, uh, a little less than a year ago, we received a large phase one uh, uh, U grant from the HEAL initiative from NIH uh, to advance our ideas around developing mink inhibitors uh, for neuropathic pain. So uh, the goal of this project is, is to optimize uh, lead drug compounds and uh, then uh, eventually prepare an IED application to move towards phase one clinical trials for neuropathic pain uh, for mink inhibitors. So we, we've made a, a, a tremendous amount of progress on this actually over this uh, relatively short time course. We've now uh, identified uh, many uh, new uh, mink inhibitors. Um, we also uh, would like to eliminate brain exposure for uh, these mink inhibitors because we're concerned about potential CNS side effects of blocking mink in over a, a long period of time in neuropathic pain patients. And we've also been successful um, in doing this. And now we have a series of very potent, very specific mink inhibitors with minimal brain exposure, uh, quite good oral bioavailability. And we're now optimizing uh, their drug-like properties uh, to eventually do um, in vivo efficacy tests and also uh, screening on human DRG neurons in collaboration, again, with Pat Doherty's lab. Uh, with the goal of, of uh, identifying a lead compound and starting our IND uh, process uh, uh, next year. So we're, we're, we're very excited about that. So that uh, summarizes kind of what we've been working on in terms of uh, electrophysiology and also uh, uh, drug discovery for targets that we gleaned from uh, animal models. Now I'm going to transition to talking about the molecular work we've been doing on human DRGs to try to identify new targets for uh, neuropathic pain that are, are uh, found completely independently of animal models. So on all these dorsal ganglion uh, we've been getting from, from Pat at MD Anderson, we've been doing RNA sequencing. We've now sequenced about 60 uh, DRGs from these uh, patients. So this this looks like a little bit of a busy slide, but uh, it, it it's not. Uh, it's it's color coded, and I'm going to explain how how to look at it. Um, and I'll I'll make a point about what we think might be some uh, interesting drivers of neuropathic pain in males and females uh, in humans with neuropathic pain. So all of the yellow uh, genes here are things that were upregulated in uh, males. Uh, with pain versus females. And all of the purple genes are things that were upregulated in the females versus the males. And then all of the genes that have these little uh, green diamonds on them are genes that are enriched in macrophages. It doesn't mean that they're only found in macrophages, but they're, they're relatively enriched in macrophages. And then genes that have these uh, red stars on them are enriched in neurons. So hopefully now that you know the color code of this, you can see that the, 
yellow stuff is very heavily uh, weighted over here and it's very macrophage heavy. So uh, we think that this is a, a good indication that consistent with the preclinical literature, uh, there is a very strong macrophage uh, drive for neuropathic pain in males. Uh, but in females, this picture looks quite different. And this is, this is also actually consistent with the emerging preclinical literature. So there's a, been a lot of work now done showing that uh, microglial contribution is kind of hard to pin down and uh, micro, macrophage uh, contribution within the DRG is kind of hard to pin down in, in uh, uh, female uh, rodents with neuropathic pain. What we see is, is that many of the genes that are upregulated in females are G-protein coupled receptors. And uh, we're pretty interested in the idea that uh, many of the changes that are happening in uh, uh, neuropathic pain in, in the female DRG are actually uh, intrinsic changes in gene expression uh, within the neurons rather than being driven necessarily by a particular uh, type of immune cell. So to try to get into that in a little bit more detail, Predict Array has been working on uh, trying to look at specific mechanisms that might be driving uh, neuropathic pain in uh, particular individuals. So one of the things that Predicta noticed when, when we first got started on this idea was that we had a relatively small subset of patients that had really, really strong upregulation of BDNF. So uh, I think most people in the pain field are familiar with BDNF. It's a, it's a neurotransmitter that uh, acts uh, or is released by uh, sensory neurons and it can act on dorsal horn neurons to cause synaptic plasticity like long-term potentiation. So um, it, it seems to be a key factor that's released from the peripheral nervous system that causes central sensitization and uh, it's upregulated in many preclinical pain models. And, and we saw that there was really strong BDNF expression only in a, in a relative uh, small subset of uh, patients from the study with MD Anderson. What was really interesting is that when Predicta did a uh, analysis that looked for co-regulation of, of other genes with BDNF, he uh, identified galanin, which is another neuropeptide, which is also uh, known to be upregulated in uh, preclinical neuropathic pain models. So this suggests that there, there might be uh, different mechanisms that drive neuropathic pain in different subsets of patients. So we decided to look at this a little bit more, uh, more broadly. And now Predicta has, has identified uh, four uh, subsets of patients uh, that we think might have different mechanistic underlying drivers of their neuropathic pain. So first we have this, this subset that's a mix of males and females that has a break, really strong upregulation of BDNF and galanin. These also ha happen to have strong upregulation of uh, GFR alpha-1, which is a, a GDNF receptor that uh, uh, people like Mike Jankowski um, in, the, in the pain field have identified as, as another particular contributor uh, to uh, nociceptor hyperexcitability. We also identified another subset that has uh, strong uh, TRPM8 upregulation as well as TREK A receptors. So we think that these, this particular patient population, for instance, instance, might have strong cold hypersensitivity and might respond to anti-NGF uh, therapeutics. We also found a, lar a larger group, which you, you might have guessed from the previous slide, that contains a bunch of genes that um, are uh, relatively enriched in macrophages. Of course, none of these are actually macrophage specific uh, genes, but they're, they're uh, found in macrophages. That's like one thing that they all have in common. These include a, a bunch of transcription factors, interleukin-6. Interestingly, almost all of these are males. So we, we think this is our group that has this underlying macrophage infiltration or, or proliferation um, that might be driving neuropathic pain. Finally, we, we have a group that has another set of immune genes. There are quite a few toll-like receptors as well as uh, chemokine receptors and the P2Y13 receptor. We don't know exactly what immune cell uh, these are coming from, but the, the, they, one thing they have in common is that they're all expressed by B cells. So that's a hypothesis that we're interested in. And then another thing that's very interesting here is that uh, these are uh, mostly all uh, females. So potential different drivers, macrophages, and, and maybe B cells, a hypothesis we're exploring in uh, females with neuropathic pain. 
So all that data I just told you about is, is bulk RNA sequencing. We think bulk RNA sequencing is useful because we, we can look at lots of different cell types at the same time, but ultimately we really need to start to uh, figure out at the, at the cellular basis what's happening here. So, you know, th that example uh, here of, of this subset is, is a, a great one for that. We, we, we think it could be B cells, but we really don't know at this point. So we need to get down to better cellular resolution. So to that end, uh, we're doing lots of RNA scope and uh, immunohistochemistry on human DRG samples. This particular sample here is uh, from a, uh, a peripheral nerve from a diabetic patient that had a lower leg amputation. So we're, we're very interested in looking at uh, local changes within uh, nerves of people with neuropathies. So Stephanie has, has really been pushing this ahead in the lab and, and has done uh, more RNA scope than I ever thought possible on uh, human DRG uh, samples. And uh, I'm gonna just show you a little bit of data about how uh, some of the things that we think we know about the uh, DRG uh, from mouse studies. Um, we may know some generalities, but uh, uh, there probably are different populations of sensory neurons in the human DRG that there, than there are in uh, mice. So I'm gonna give you some, spe some specifics on that. So th the first thing that we tried was to look at the so-called peptidergic versus non-peptidergic population. So, you can't really do IV4 staining on human uh, uh, DRG because it, it doesn't work. Um, IV4 doesn't stain anything in, in the human DRG. So what we did instead was to use uh, uh, CGRP, Calc A gene, and P2X3, uh, the, the, uh, the, P2, the ATP receptor that's found uh, in these IV4 positive neurons as markers for these populations. So what we see in the in the mouse is very consistent with a, a, a very uh, uh, long literature where these populations are mostly uh, segregated. There is a little bit more overlap at the mRNA level than what you see at the protein level uh, between these and mouse. And this is actually very consistent with some single cell sequencing uh, experiments coming from the, the Lenarsen and Earnfors labs. But in human, there's far more overlap between these. And that mostly happens because there's an expansion of the total uh, percentage of neurons that express uh, the CGRP uh, gene. So in, in human DRG, about 60% of the neurons seem to express Calc A mRNA, uh, whereas in mice, that it's closer to uh, 30%. So there's far more overlap between these populations in humans than there are in uh, mice. So an, another key gene that we, we looked at was uh, trp one So trp one is mostly found in the peptidergic population uh, in uh, mice, which is, is reflected here. But we were pretty surprised in, in human DRG, and we've done this now from three independent uh, organ donors, um, essentially all of the uh, smaller diameter neurons that express these nociceptor markers also express trp one So it seems like in human, the vast majority of putative nociceptors likely express uh, trp one So there's an expansion of the CGRP expressing population, expansion of the trp one expressing population, but the trpa one population is decreased. So in mice, trpa one is mostly expressed in the IV4 population. And then there's a shrinking of this trpa one positive uh, population uh, in humans. So there's some, some interesting changes in these populations that we've all kind of uh, grown to, uh, uh, to know from mouse DRG. There are also some striking examples of, of genes that uh, particularly for receptors that are not expressed in the mouse DRG at all, but are actually found in human DRG. So this is one of my favorite, the alpha-9 nicotinic receptor. There's been a, a lot of really interesting group uh, work done from a, a group at the University of, of Utah, looking at alpha-9 nicotinic antagonists as potential therapeutics uh, for neuropathic pain. And uh, alpha-9 is expressed by T cells in mice where it's thought to act to uh, uh, reduce uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, but there's a striking species difference here. In, in humans, alpha-9 nicotinic receptors are expressed in, in uh, many uh, DRG neurons, and they seem to mostly be found in this uh, overlapping CGRP and P2X3 
uh, expressing population. So I, I think that this is interesting from the perspective of thinking about alpha-9 as a, as a target for uh, neuropathic pain, where you might get a, a kind of double whammy in humans, where you could have a beneficial effect both on DRG neurons and on uh, T cells. We also have uh, become very interested in finding uh, targets from our, our transcriptomic work and then looking at, at where those receptors are found within the DRG. So one of the things that we noted in our, in our bulk sequencing experiments was that oncostatin M, which is a, a cytokine, uh, was very strongly upregulated in uh, our neuropathic pain patients. So uh, oncostatin M acts via uh, a IL-6 receptor uh, family uh, receptor signaling complex. So it, contain, it contains the GP130 uh, signal transducer and then the oncostatin M receptor or OSMR. So we wanted to explore where this was expressed in the human DRG. And what we found was that many uh, human DRG neurons, about 20% of them, uh, expressed the onco oncostatin M receptor. Um, this receptor also seems to be expressed in, in neurons in the mouse DRG. But interestingly, when we looked, uh, we saw this very clear signal around neurons as well. So uh, these are satellite glial cells that uh, surround many of these DRG neurons. And uh, these uh, express really robustly the oncostatin M receptor. This is interesting because in the mouse uh, DRG, uh, from single cell sequencing experiments, uh, which have mostly been done by the, by the Lenarsen lab, satellite glial cells do not express the oncostatin M receptor at all. So th this uh, suggests a potential expansion of signaling of oncostatin M uh, within uh, the DRG in, in uh, humans that might be involved in uh, neuropathic pain. So to summarize all this kind of molecular work that we've done on the human DRG so far, we, we, we see that there's this expansion of the uh, CGRP population, and there's a, a great deal of overlap between CalK and, and P2X3 uh, compared to mice. And additionally, uh, there are far more human neurons that express uh, trp one suggesting that probably most human nociceptors at least express the mRNA um, uh, for trp one so we probably will not have the luxury of, of taking DRGs out of neuropathic pain, pa out of your average everyday neuropathic pain patient to do this kind of molecular profiling and, and try to understand what's driving their neuropathic pain anytime soon. Um, but uh, we can sometimes obtain nerves from these patients uh, through nerve biopsies or, or things like that. We can also get skin biopsies from most patients. In fact, for certain types of neuropathies, that, that's a standard part of their clinical diagnosis. So another thing we've been focused on is, is trying to examine whether or not mRNAs are, are uh, robustly transported uh, in axons of these uh, sensory neurons and if we can find them in, in the peripheral nerve. If that, if that is true, it suggests that you could get relatively small samples of the peripheral nerve and get some insight into how the transcriptome is changing within the DRG by sampling these uh, transported mRNAs. So here, what I'm showing is uh, trp one and uh, SCN9A, NAV1.7 uh, mRNA found within uh, a human uh, sural nerve using RNA scope. And you can see that there is both trp one and uh, NAV1.7 signal. Interestingly, a lot of the signal seems to be in uh, uh, Schwann cells. So it, it, it somehow is, is making its way out of the axons um, or uh, some of these Schwann cells within the nerve actually express these mRNAs. So we're, we're, we're actively trying to uh, figure this out using a variety of uh, sequencing technologies, but I think it has some promise for being able to sample peripheral nerves. And this shows you piezo2, another uh, sensory-specific uh, 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 gene. And we can also detect piezo2 mRNA uh, in uh, human sural nerves. So that, that's one way we could potentially do this. Uh, another is, is we could uh, look at interactions between diseased tissue and human nociceptors. So that's what Andy and Candler have been uh, focusing on in their work. So the idea here is that we have a, a, a good uh, 
a baseline data set for what receptors are expressed in the human DRG. And we could take uh, samples from individual patients, for instance, synovial fluid, um, do sequencing, compare the ligands that are found in their uh, uh, cells in their uh, synovial fluid versus uh, the DRG neurons, and identify ligand receptor interactions that might be important for driving pain in that individual, and then tailor uh, therapeutics uh, around that. So uh, we had to, we had to do a lot of kind of baseline work to make this work. So Andy and Candler uh, really kind of poured themselves as, as well as many of our uh, undergrads on our, our team that worked on this project into uh, curating lists of ligand receptor interactions. And we finally developed a list of about 3,000 interactions between ligands and receptors. And then Andy built a, a, a platform where you can take uh, RNA sequencing experiments uh, uh, from uh, different sources and run these against each other to, to find the ligand receptor interactions within those particular data sets. So I'll, I'll give you just a, a couple of quick examples of how we've done that. So well, one, one relatively straightforward thing that we could do is to use some of these single cell sequencing data sets from the, the uh, uh, Lenarsen lab in Sweden uh, and separate out uh, different classes of uh, sensory neurons as well as the support cells, the satellite glial cells and the Schwann cells that are, are found within the DRG, with the idea that we can look at how uh, intragang intraganglionic transmission from neurons uh, to these glial cells and vice versa might influence each other. So this particular one is looking at uh, neuronal ligands uh, versus glial uh, receptors, so receptors that are expressed by satellite uh, glial cells and Schwann cells. And we were really surprised here. I mean, we, 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 we have not seen very many things in the literature looking at these kind of interactions, but we found some pretty robust uh, things. One, one of the things that we were really quite interested in is uh, CGRP, which of course I'm not gonna be able to find on, on the list here uh, right now, but uh, CGRP is here. And CGRP receptors are actually pretty robustly expressed by many of these satellite glial cells and Schwann cells. So, you know, one of the most robustly expressed and released neuropeptides within uh, the DRG might be having a, a trophic action on the satellite glial cells and Schwann cells. So if, if you look at this uh, vice versa, the so now going from glial ligands to neuronal receptors, this actually expands uh, uh, pretty massively. It, it really is impressive how many ligands uh, for neuronal receptors are expressed by satellite glial cells and Schwann cells. And I, I know there's a number of people in, in the pain field that are actively working on, especially satellite glial cells and their potential role in uh, neuropathic pain and chronic inflammatory pain. And I, I, I think, you know, from, from this kind of analysis, you can see just how interesting uh, those particular lines of work uh, could be uh, moving ahead. So we, we wanted to try to apply this to a, a specific clinical situation and, you know, the, the there's just an absolute explosion in the number of experiments that are being done in uh, disease states using RNA sequencing. So this, this particular paper was published pretty recently in Science Translational Medicine, and what, what these investigators were doing is that they were taking macrophages from uh, people with either rheumatoid arthritis or uh, osteoarthritis and characterizing uh, those macrophages. And they, they identified uh, specific macrophages that seem to be involved in uh, disease and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as specific macrophages that seem to be involved in disease and osteoarthritis. So what we did was then to build interactomes with these from the human DRG data that we already had. And I'm just going to focus on what we found for the rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, here, uh, the, the results were, uh, I, I think, pr pretty interesting. First, we saw a, a down regulation of IL-10. So uh, IL-10 uh, seems to be uh, a really important uh, factor uh, for uh, pain resolution. And uh, this seems to be down regulated. So you, know, you might be losing a, a pain resolution mechanism. And then we also found several things that were really strongly expressed uh, in uh, these uh, macrophages uh, promoting uh, rheumatoid arthritis including epiregulin, which is an EGFR 
uh, receptor uh, agonist. So a, a really nice study from Luda Diachinko, uh, Jeff Vogel, and uh, Lauren Martin, published a couple of years ago in JCI, demonstrated the potential role of epiregulin in, in, in promoting many types of pain through the EGFR receptor. And we also found a, a, another ligand, HBEGF, that also acts via the EGFR receptor uh, that was uh, pretty strongly increased in, in rheumatoid arthritis uh, patient macrophages. Oncostatin M was also found here, as well as uh, uh, some other uh, factors acting on TNF receptors. And of course, uh, TNF receptor or uh, uh, TNF sequestering therapeutics are kind of the uh, standard of care now for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. But there's a pretty complex mixture of uh, potential pain promoting agonists uh, that are expressed here in these rheumatoid arthritis uh, macrophages. So we just we decided to focus in more on HBEGF because essentially nothing is known about HBEGF in the context of pain. So having this uh, human data in hand, we, we decided to go back to the mouse and uh, we, we did two experiments. We, we first tested whether HBEGF could actually uh, activate uh, mouse uh, sensory neurons. So here we use calcium imaging uh, to do this. And we saw that about 30% of mouse uh, sensory neurons uh, respond to HBEGF. And that HBEGF effect is uh, completely blocked by uh, lapatinib, which is a EGFR uh, receptor antagonist. So HBEGF does seem to be able to excite mouse nociceptors, uh, and it does it via the EGFR receptor. And then we tested whether or not this uh, uh, EGFR uh, agonist can cause uh, uh, mechanical pain or grimacing uh, in mice with injection into the hind paw. So uh, what we saw here is that in both uh, males and females, we get me mechanical hypersensitivity. Uh, we get uh, grimacing, which is a little bit more robust in the females than it is in the males. And if you look at, at both of these combined, really nice uh, uh, mechanical hypersensitivity induced by uh, HBGF as well as uh, transient grim grimacing after the injection. So this suggests that e uh, HBGF in addition to epiregulin is an EGFR agonist that can uh, stimulate pain behaviors um, in mice and it's associated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, in humans. All right, so we're all at home uh, because of COVID-19. So I, I wanna just show you one more uh, application of, of this uh, interactome technology that we're interested in. So um, your airway is innervated by nociceptors and your upper airway is mostly innervated by the vagus nerve. Your lungs are innervated by a mix of nociceptors that come from the thoracic DRG and from the vagus nerve. And uh, the lungs are a key battleground in this disease, as I think everybody is, is very well aware now. So uh, uh, people like Isaac Chu have, have shown uh, really nicely that uh, nociceptor innervation of the airway plays a key role in the um, disease response. And we have sequenced many, many thoracic uh, DRGs from the collaboration with, with uh, Pat. So we decided to use that data and uh, look at ligands coming from uh, immune cells in the lung of COVID-19 patients. So th these were from experiments that were done um, in China in some of the earliest uh, severe uh, COVID-19 patients. We used their, their sequencing data uh, with a lot of help from uh, those investigators. So they really played a, a huge role in helping us understand uh, very quickly their uh, data sets. And then we looked for interactions between those immune cells and the severe patients and uh, thoracic DRG neurons. And so I'm not gonna show you all, all the, the details, I'll just, I'll just summarize uh, basically what we found. So uh, first of all, we found that a bunch of ligands that are upregulated in, in the lung of these uh, COVID-19 patients are genes that are very well known to be regulated at the level of translation by mink-driven eif phosphorylation. So we, we think that um, this could be another potential application of um, uh, mink inhibitors. So for uh, potential alleviation of the lung severe lung inflammation that happens in these patients. 
we also saw uh, some pretty strong indications of uh, uh, ligands that could act directly on uh, on uh, nociceptors coming from the thoracic DRGs that might be uh, promoting um, inflammation in the lung. So these included CCL2, which can act on a number of receptors that are expressed by uh, uh, human DRG neurons, epiregulin, which I was just talking about that acts via EGFR, and then some uh, fibroblast growth factors that have, have recently been described as interacting with uh, voltage-gated sodium channels like uh, NAV1.6. A final question is, uh, could the virus itself potentially interact with sensory neurons through ACE2 expression and sensory neurons? So that's the next question that we uh, uh, set out to answer with our, our human DRG. So Stephanie uh, uh, got her hands on some RNA scope probes for ACE2 and looked at, at ACE2 expression in, in uh, both lumbar and thoracic uh, DRGs from uh, either these organ donors or, or surgery patients. And what we see is that ACE2 is indeed expressed in a relatively small uh, proportion. So it's about 20 to 25 percent of uh, the neurons uh, here. And uh, many of these neurons are, are positive for both uh, CGRP and P2X3. Many of them also happen to express MRG, PRD, and uh, NPPB, NPPB. So I think this is important because we know that these MRGD positive neurons form free uh, nerve endings in the skin and also in some of the luminal uh, organs. So uh, it suggests that uh, the virus might have access potentially uh, to sensory neurons uh, via ACE2 expression, and that the sensory neurons that do express ACE2 are likely ones that have uh, free nerve endings that are, are out at the surfaces of, of your skin and uh, 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 also uh, your uh, internal organs that might make them susceptible to uh, infection uh, by the virus. So I, I want to just mention one final thing uh, related to this is that it's recently been published that in addition to uh, uh, loss of sense of taste and smell, that many people that have uh, COVID-19 lose chemical sensation uh, in their oral cavity. So um, that includes losing sensation for menthol and capsaicin. So it's possible that uh, part of the way that that happens is that the virus infects the sensory neurons that are uh, leading to those sensations and, and is somehow silencing them. So that, that's obviously just a hypothesis, but um, that's something that uh, is suggested by the expression of ACE2 in these neurons. All right, so uh, to wrap up, I just want to kind of point out where we're, we're trying to go with all this. So uh, first, uh, I think we're really heavily invested in trying to create really rich resources that everybody can use. So um, I, I hope that uh, most of you already know that we have these websites that we, ha that we house here at UT Dallas, where you can go and, and look through any of our data sets to look at your, your favorite targets. Um, we're currently trying to expand uh, that right now. So if you, if you search for our uh, sensoryomics uh, website, you'll see that we, we, we revamped our front page and we're, we're trying to make all this data kind of more integrated and more accessible um, to anybody that, that is interested in it. And uh, we'll soon have peripheral nerve transcriptomes um, included in there. So we're, we're really trying to do the best that we can to make this as, as uh, available as possible to everybody within the field. Um, we're actively working on doing single cell sequencing in human DRG. We're actually doing spatial transcriptomics uh, using the Visium system uh, from 10X Genomics. And uh, we're also working on doing this from uh, nerve samples with the hopes that we'll be able to more thoroughly understand the neuroimmune component that is uh, driving uh, neuropathic pain in uh, neuropathic pain patients. We are actively developing this interactome, as, as I just mentioned, as a way to identify new therapeutic targets. And for instance, H HBGF interacting with EGFR is one such example. And uh, our ultimate goal is to be able to use these technologies um, to uh, develop patient-specific mechanistic insight into what causes uh, neuropathic pain. And because we are entrepreneurial uh, here, we're uh, getting close to launching this new company called Dolaromics, whose, whose mission will be to uh, try to implement this 
uh, in a way that it would be accessible um, uh, uh, to uh, investigators and also to patients. So I, I want to stop uh, here and just again point out the really great people that I work with uh, that, that did the work I talked to you about today, as well as all the rest of my group. Predipta did all of the uh, RNA sequencing analysis. Stephanie did all the RNA scope work. Andy and Candler have uh, done all the work on the uh, interactome. Mo uh, did the uh, HBGF behavior, and uh, DJ uh, did the calcium signaling that I talked to you about. Mo, Mo and DJ are, are, are brand new uh, PhD students in the lab. All this work is a collaborative effort with, with lots of really great investigators. Uh, Greg and I have worked together again for uh, uh, a really long time now. Um, Michael Burton and Zach Campbell at UTD have just been terrific to work with, as well as uh, Taehoon Kim and uh, Joe Pancrazio. And then our, our collaboration with uh, Pat Doherty, as well as Kobe and Anamika at MD Anderson uh, has just been uh, terrific. Finally, uh, none of this is possible at all um, without, without the support of uh, NIH. And some of the work I talked today about today was also supported uh, by Merck. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Ted, for the fantastic presentation. And we do have time for questions. Um, you can post them in the questions tab and I'll read them to Ted. Um, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to ask the question without writing it in. Um, I'll start while people um, put their questions together. Ted, it really, it strikes me just how much uh, variability there is to, to address you and, and, and the complications male versus female, the state of the immune system, uh, the type of neuropathic pain and the region of the body affected. How do you suggest that, um, especially those in biotech or pharmaceutical industry go about this or developing medicines? Is, are we headed towards personalized medicine for the treatment of pain? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, I think we, we, we should be thinking um, along those lines, but I, I, I don't think that it ultimately is going to boil down to every patient has some kind of different mechanistic driver. I, th I think what, what we're seeing is uh, uh, some very clear trends uh, of uh, specific kind of subsets of neuropathic pain. So. Um, I'm struck by how kind of consistent the macrophage type signature is within many of our male uh, neuropathic pain patients. Mm -hmm. And also how consistent that is with a lot of the preclinical literature. So I, I think that uh, there are a lot of really good opportunities there. I think in, in uh, the story in females, like uh, we're, we're, we're tremendously behind in the preclinical part of this and understanding what's actually driving neuropathic pain in, in females. So there's, there's a, a lot of work to be done there. But I'm pretty excited about the, you know, it, it, it's not perfect consistency, but the relative consistency of what we seem to be seeing uh, in the female neuropathic pain patients. Um, and I think that there's a huge opportunity there uh, because if, if we if we better understand that, uh, uh, it, it, it should lead to all kinds of uh, brand new therapeutic opportunities that maybe we haven't been thinking about very much collectively. Um, I also think that, you know, for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, osteoarthritis, that uh, there's great opportunities in using these kind of data sets that we can generate now to find um, uh, mixes of uh, mediators that are likely interacting with nociceptors to make them hyperexcitable in those specific deep disease states. So, you know, I, I imagine that there will be a, 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 a fair amount of um, uh, commonalities and differences, but I, I think if, if we can understand how these factors are signaling that uh, there, there's likely to be a lot of commonality because they do seem to fall within specific subclasses of receptors, and these receptors all have conserved signaling mechanisms that, that they don't all signal in individually differently. So, I think right. you know we we can use the information and the variability to think about how we would uh, try to approach it uh, therapeutically. Okay, thanks. Very helpful. So we do have several questions from the audience. Um, here's one. Uh, 
from your one of your earlier slides, what happens after 24, 48 hours or a week um, of any change in the pattern that you observed in first two hours of exposure to IL-6? So uh, we haven't really done experiments like that. Uh, I, I think we, we have we have recorded for longer periods of time and the uh, spontaneous activity continues, but we, we haven't tried to examine yet whether there are different mechanisms involved in the initiation versus the maintenance and if that changes over uh, uh, a period of time. For instance, if it's different at, at like uh, three hours versus 48 hours, which would be kind of akin to, you know, your early versus late LTP mechanisms, which are are, are quite distinct from each other. So it's, right. a, it's a really, I think that's an extraordinarily interesting area uh, to do work, um, but we, we have not, uh, uh, tried to uh, address that. Okay, uh, we do have a, a direct question from Sandy Eldridge, Eldridge in the audience. Uh, I'll unmute Sandy. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. I assume you can hear me. Yep, I can hear you. Um, yeah. Well, that was a fantastic seminar. You thank you very much for making my day. <laughs> sure. So I, I am call. I am here from the National Cancer Institute. And our investigative toxicology lab is specifically interested in developing a model to um, recapitulate chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And so, um, as you can imagine, it's challenging. And I'm wondering how translatable um, your efforts in would be to CIPN, so chemotherapy peripheral neuropathy so that's that's one question i probably have a whole bunch but i won't try to ask them all off all of them <laughs> so the other thing is um is you know we ha we're concerned that maybe we, we think that we need to be focusing on drg yeah because we think that of course it, it seems the dogma is that that's the target for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy but we're also wondering if maybe there's an important um, component between the CNS and the PNS that could be playing a role there. So, sure. you know, we're looking at human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived DRG as a starter for a, a cell in vitro model, but also based on the, some of the things you've said, I'm wondering if if maybe we should be looking at a mixed cell population, um, yeah. realizing the importance of other cell types. So right. Right. why don't I stop there and let you talk? <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so those, those are uh, great questions and I, I could talk for probably quite some time about them, but I, I, I'm sure I, I couldn't actually give you an answer because I, I think uh, these are things that lots of people are currently thinking and and, and trying to work out, but I, I, I doubt that anybody feels like they really have a, a firm grasp on them. But um, so, you know, Pat, Pat and I have, have talked quite a bit about uh, these patients that we get from MD Anderson, where, where we're trying to understand what, what exactly is causing this spontaneous activity. And, you know, th they're really complex patients that they, they have cancer. Uh, most of them have had some kind of chemotherapy. Many of them are on pain medications. and um, it, it's it's hard to know uh, why they have uh, spontaneous activity. It's e it's even hard to understand in some cases why some of them don't have pain because if you look at, at their their uh, scans, um, you'd be like, this patient has to be in pain, but they're not. And you know the, the pain versus non-pain correlates extremely well with the spontaneous activity. So uh, I, I know that that there are, are are groups that are working on models where you expose the DRG neurons correctly directly to the chemotherapeutic agent, but you know I, I think uh, there also is a really important neuroimmune interaction that's happening there, and and you know I guess what what we would like to be able to do eventually is is to do enough of these kind of sequencing experiments that we're doing, and, and we're funded to do it now, so we, we 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 will be working on it over the next couple of years, where we eventually have enough. Enough data, enough uh, enough sequencing data, enough enough patient information, where we can start to make calls about uh, 
what is causing what in terms of what we see. And I think that that would be very informative for thinking about how, how to do the kind of experiments maybe that you're talking about. I, I, I think that the IPSC nociceptor idea is, is a really good one. And uh, I, I know that there are lots of people that are working on this and I think it's a really important part of our field. So I, I, I encourage it, um, um, but we haven't worked with it very much, mostly because we are kind of in this unique position where we do have a lot of access to human DRG and, and we're, we're kind of focused as much as we can be there. Although we, we've recently started working with Angelica Lampert in Germany um, uh, to try to do some uh, more thorough uh, uh, comparisons between the IPSC nociceptors that she develops versus uh, our uh, human DRG data. So to try to get an idea of you know exactly what types of sensory neurons are are, are there. I know there are other people uh, like Alex Chesler at uh, NIH that are actively working on that as well. So there's there's lots of really uh, interesting work to do. Ted, I can also comment on um, her question about the DRGs versus uh, other you know, parts of the nervous system. At Antibios, we're collaborating with Eli and Lily to develop a human spinal cord electrophysiology assay. So um, stay tuned for that. So Ted, we are at the top of the hour. Are you able to stay on? We have several questions yeah. if you can stay on for a yeah. few more minutes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So someone asked um, about the, the chemo agent, I presume, in the collaboration with Pat Doherty. Uh, was it oxaliplatin? What, can you comment on that? I mean, it varies actually. So yeah. uh, the, the, these patients have uh, different cancers and have been on uh, different types of chemotherapeutic agents. Um, Pat could probably uh, immediately uh, roll off uh, which ones they were. I, I can't off the top of my head, but uh, it, it's not a single one. Okay. Um, here's a question. Do you think that a few minutes of EFT 508 treatment is sufficient to reverse translational changes that drive hyperexcitability? Uh, it seems to, well, it depends on what your definition of few is. So <laughs> uh, uh, it does not have an immediate effect. Um, so I think we're, we're all very confident that it's not just blocking a, a, a sodium channel or something like that. It's surprising right. how, how quickly it does work, though. So um, we're pretty actively trying to understand uh, why it works so quickly. You know, mm -hmm. mink, mink has been studied pretty extensively and it has very few targets other than EIF4E. So, and all of these effects are recapitulated in EIF4E fossil mutant mice. So, um, right. we also have done very extensive testing of uh, EFT 508 uh, specificity, as has effector therapeutics. And, you know, th this is a, a really, uh, remarkably selective kinase inhibitor, and it's it. So mink has has a has a slightly atypical uh, ATP binding pocket, which which allows for some more distinct pharmacology than what you typically get with these kind of kinase inhibitors. So you know that, that that's a big advantage to making specific um, specific blockers of the kinase. Um, mm -hmm. So we we have we have we have data that it decreases uh, uh, T type calcium channels and that it can do that relatively uh, rapidly. Um, it doesn't do it by, by simply blocking them. Um, but, you know, I, I can't totally rule out the possibility that it might act on some unknown target. But, you know, it has such a profound effect on excitability that uh, it, at the end of the day, uh, whatever that target is, um, I guess that doesn't really matter as long as it does what right. you really want it to do and it's safe. And I yep. think we, we know now from the experience of Effector as well as Ohm uh, Therapeutics, which is also developing these uh, inhibitors for cancer, that they, they are safe. Yep. Here's a related question. Can you comment on the effect of the mink inhibitor on DRG action potential activity? It seems quite fast for a translation mechanism, in particular the return of activity upon washout within five minutes. Do you have any yeah. independent confirmation that the phosphorylation event of the substrate occurs in that time frame? Uh, yes, so we, we do know that the phosphorylation events occur in that time frame. We do not know uh, definitively that it's uh, uh, which mRNAs are being translated. So we're, we're, we're now using uh, TRAP technology 
in in mouse because we can't do it in, in humans to to identify the the exact targets mRNA targets of EIF4 E phosphorylation in, in mouse nociceptors. Um, we we have some clues. Uh, we, we don't we we're pretty sure it's not translation of the channels themselves. That that doesn't make sense for the time frame. We think it probably has to do with trafficking. Um, and again, um, we can't totally rule out the possibility that is it that it is a a uh, an event that is not uh, translation uh, regulation on those okay. short time scales. Interesting. Here's another verbal question from the audience. Um, Anil Kalia, if you're still there, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question that um, um, Ming signaling, uh, signaling L4E uh, inhibitors, what concentration um, is, uh, 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 is enough for the inhibition? I mean to say, how is the potency? And uh, what about the uh, central uh, nervous system penetration of these compounds? And secondly, sure. um, 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 what about the expression of uh, uh, NAV1.7 on swan cells? So you was talking about swan cells. Do you mean to say that uh, they are highly expressed there? Mm, okay, yeah. So uh, yeah. first question for EFT5 weight. So th these are... These are uh, EFT5 weight is a really uh, potent inhibitor. It's uh, IC50 against the recombinant uh, kinase is about one nanomolar, and it's IC50 in cells um, is between one and, and uh, 10 nanomolar. The experiments that we use, we did it with 25 nanomolar. So, um, and at, at that concentration, it doesn't really have any other known targets within the human kinome. Um, we've screened against uh, GPCRs uh, uh, at the PSPP um, at uh, University of North Carolina and, and didn't find activity at those concentrations either. Um, so we, we think it's a specific effect. Um, the second question, what was the second question again? Regarding the swan cells? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we see uh, both trip 1 and NAV 1.8 mRNA puncta in uh, what appear to be swan cells. And, and, uh, but, but I don't think that the swan cells really express uh, uh, these mRNAs. So th there there's, have now been a couple of different papers uh, showing that Schwann cells can form these invaginations with uh, uh, axons in, in peripheral nerves. And then, of course, there, there's this other paper from Ern, the Ernfors lab that was published in either Science or Nature, I, I don't remember, uh, about a year ago, showing that there's direct communication uh, at axon terminals between Schwann cells and uh, uh, nerve endings. So. There seems to be, it seems to be possible that there would be some transfer of material between this, these cells, and it's been shown experimentally. And then one, one of the long standing uh, uh, things in, in the neuroscience field that has led people to this conclusion that they, I don't think they really have uh, anymore, uh, that translation doesn't happen within axons, is that there are relatively few ribosomes in axons. But of course, swan cells have a lot of. Uh, ribosomes. So uh, I, I think it's possible that there's certain types of Schwann cells that form these invaginations where mRNAs that are transported in the axons can enter those cells, be translated, and then the protein can be transferred back uh, into the axon. So uh, we, we're trying now to test doing uh, uh, NuCSeq uh, from human nerves to see if uh, trip 1 NAV 1.7, et cetera, are being actively transcribed um, in Schwann cells in the nerve, and I, I'd be fairly surprised uh, if they were. So I, I, I think that uh, we have a long way to go to show that that's actually what happening is happening, but that's that's the idea. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's another a question from Angelica Lampert. Um, she said, you mentioned FTF13 and immune cells of COVID-19 patients. 
when it interacts with sodium channels, it does so from the intracellular side. How does yeah. it get it get there, or is it upregulated in those receptors? So it's coming it's coming from immune cells, so it would have to be uh, uh, taken up uh, if it was going to have some uh, action on the uh, so on sodium channels and nociceptive uh, endings. So uh, we're obviously not able to test that hypothesis directly uh, in mm -hmm. the human lung. Um, uh, it's also possible it could have uh, completely different actions that are independent of the of, uh, uh, sodium channels because it, uh, th there are other receptors uh, that are also expressed uh, by nociceptors for these uh, FGF proteins. Okay, and here's a question from Cheryl Stuckey, who will be our next webinar speaker in June. Given the extensive expression of TRIP-V1 in human DRGs, do you think efforts should be enhanced in finding pain therapeutics for this target, uh, therapies that lack the thermal regulatory issues? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, Johnson & Johnson is now in phase three uh, with their trip one antagonist that has uh, relatively smaller uh, hyperthermia uh, liabilities than uh, other clinical candidate compounds, and uh, we're going to see. So I, I think that's yeah. a, that's that's one conclusion you, you could reach. Uh, and uh, Johnson and Johnson has continued to put their money behind this, so I, I guess we're 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 going to find out. Still an important target. Yeah. Um, here's a question: Any update on expected timelines for a single cell human DRG RNA seq data set? Well, you know, I mean, I I, I think uh, uh, it's probably been accomplished by at least uh, one or two groups out there using a. Uh, NukeSeq approach, and uh, when it when it comes out, I'm I'm sure it will be extremely useful to people. We we've decided to do it a little differently. We're going to do spatial transcriptomics uh, using uh, one of the the Tenex spatial transcriptomics uh, uh, techniques called Visium, and uh, we're we're starting those experiments now. So um, we, we 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 will. I think be generating a data set that will be a little bit different from the approach that others have probably taken. And I, I would imagine that the combination of these things is going to be extraordinarily useful to people. Absolutely. Um, since you see commonalities between neuropathic pain models, do you think that the RNA changes you find are caused by the spontaneous activity or their activity dependent mechanisms? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, there's really not an easy way for us to know that, although mm -hmm. what, what Pat's lab is starting to do is to do uh, patch seek on these uh, uh, neurons. And I, I assume, you know, we, we could maybe eventually start to be able to answer that kind of question using that kind of technique. Um, but we've got, a, we've got a long way to go before we'd be there. But yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. There, there must be some, some set of genes that are responsible for you know the, the origination of the spontaneous activity, and presumably they are also responsible for this these uh, uh, oscillations in the resting membrane potential because those two things seem to coincide as as Pat and well as Mar Marshall DeVore showed you know over over many years, and then as, as Pat and Terry Walters have kind of dissected very nicely over in Houston. But then yeah, there, there probably are another subset of genes that are are being regulated in an activity dependent fashion by the spontaneous activity. And I guess the big question would be how long do you have to turn off the spontaneous activity to make that activity dependent transcription, transcriptional change or translational change um, uh, go away? And we don't have any idea. Okay, let's do one more. Thanks for indulging us and staying on a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. um, in addition to different distribution of DRG cell populations in human DRG versus mouse. Are there entirely distinct populations of cells in human that aren't seen in the mouse data? Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel pretty confident about that, but uh, mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're trying to nail that down. And uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to speculate too much on it, but uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah. think so. Okay. Well, fantastic. Um, there are so many questions we could go for another hour. So what I'll do is I'll send you the list of questions, Ted, and uh, encourage those in the audience to reach out to you by email. 
Um, okay. Thanks again for a great presentation, especially the, the end about COVID-19. That was fantastic. I'd like to thank my colleague, Gary Watkins, Director of Marketing and Antibios for putting this together. And thank you all for attending. And we look forward to um, having you back in June for two more great pain webinars. Thanks, everyone. Those too. Thank you. Have a great day. Great evening. Goodbye, everyone.